Part 3. Bloody Nose 14. We continued on Highway 202. It followed the freeway close enough that we could see its lights blazing through the trees. This went on for maybe four miles before the freeway veered off to the southeast, and we continued on toward the heart of Concord. Reaching the outskirts of the city, we saw the freeway was not the only place where streetlights were working, although none of the houses or buildings we passed seemed to have any lights on. The snow was still falling, even thicker now, with the large flakes clumping together in the air. Concord was eerie, the streetlights illuminating what was essentially a ghost town. If the electricity is on, I'd bet a hundred bucks that the Chinese have troops here, Indigo said. I'd say so, but there's not much we can do about it if we want to get to Drake Mountain, Sonny said. Maybe you should turn the headlights off, I said. The snow is reflecting enough light from the streetlights that we don't really need it. He followed my suggestion. The road was still plenty visible in the ambient glow of the streetlights, and hopefully we'd now be less noticeable. Should we stop and ask the others their opinions about this new development, or should we just keep pushing on? I asked. I think push on, said Indigo, with a frown creasing her face. Like Sonny said, there isn't much we can do about it, short of scrapping the trip altogether, and do we really have anywhere else we can go? Could we turn back and loop around, avoiding this city? I asked Sonny. Probably, he said. But it would use up a lot of gas to do that. The roundabout way is long, all the way through Vermont and back. I looked at the gas gauge on the dashboard. It now read a little over a third of a tank. Darn it. This thing gets horrible mileage. What do you expect? It's a rental truck. Sonny said lightly. Look, throw in the fact that we don't know if any other way we go is actually going to be safer than this way or not, and I think it's better we stick with this route. He paused at a traffic light which was blinking red. I was thankful we were the only ones that appeared to be out on this cold night. Maybe we could get some gas, Indigo said. If the lights are working, the pumps might be too. We just need to find a gas station. No, Sonny's right, I said, shaking my head. It would be too dangerous to stop and try and get fuel. I guess we stick to the plan unless we come across a real threat. Okay, we push ahead, Sonny agreed, pulling through the intersection and continuing his drive deeper into the city. Street signs indicated that if we continued down the highway, we'd eventually reach Interstate 93, the freeway that should take us north to Lincoln. From there, we could join the road leading to Drake Mountain Resort. According to Indigo, who was examining the Atlas, it was about 30 miles or more to Campton, where we planned to ditch the truck, and another five from there to Lincoln. Sonny said from Lincoln to the ski lodge, where we assumed the safe haven was, was another couple of miles, so it looked like we'd be walking at least seven miles. I desperately hoped it would stop snowing by then. The drive through Concord was eerie, the emptiness only highlighted by the illumination of the streetlights. I couldn't help looking at the rows of darkened houses, wondering how many dead Americans were entombed in the snow-topped buildings. I shuddered. Indigo saw it first. There's a building with lights on up there, she said, pointing ahead. We might want to take a side street and go around. Following her finger, I saw what looked to be a squat building about two blocks up on the right. There was a neon Budweiser sign lighting up the street in front of it. Sonny slowed the speed of the truck and we inched closer. I could see there were four Humvees parked in the small lot. Clearly, the soldiers were inside the bar, probably enjoying some leisure time. Something about Chinese troops sitting around drinking in an American bar while its former owners rotted in their homes all around them stung me badly. Take the next left, I said to Sonny, then a right and pull over. You want to stop? He asked. I want to take a closer look. Maybe we can learn something. I don't know. It's pretty risky. Are you sure? 
Well, if nothing else, we might be able to find a way to disable their hummers, I said. That could prevent at least this group from chasing us if we're spotted. He regarded me for a moment, a curious look on his face. All right, I guess I'd buy that, he said. He took the next left and then turned right onto a parallel road before pulling into a dark alley. Who are you taking with you? Luke, I said, without even thinking. I take you, but we can't both go. We're the only drivers. Besides, you're still not 100%. I'm going too, Indigo said. I can't let you and Luke have all the fun all the time. Are you sure? I asked her. It could be dangerous. No kidding, she said, crossing her arms. Don't worry about me. I can pull my weight. I never said you couldn't, but... I said. The next words kind of tumbled out of my mouth without me thinking. It's just that I like you. A lot, actually, and I'd hate if anything happened. My sentence was cut off when she leaned over and put her lips on mine. Excitement shot through me like a bolt of electricity. I like you too, Isaac, she said, as she pulled away, smiling. And I don't want you to get hurt either. But that's not going to stop you from going, is it? I guess not, I said, my face glowing. Suddenly the night didn't seem so cold anymore, and I wondered how Luke would feel when he found out Indigo had stolen a kiss from me. All right, I said. I guess just be careful and I'll try to do the same. Deal. So, let's get Luke and get started. We said our goodbyes to Sonny, who told us he would keep the truck running, but he was going out to stretch after the long drive. We also agreed that if we weren't back in half an hour, he would assume the worst and leave without us. Indigo and I climbed out of the truck and went around to the back. Luke was already crouching by the door, holding his crossbow as I opened it. What's up? He asked, and then I saw his eyes widen as he saw the streetlights. The power's on? I take it this isn't just another whiz stop, then. He jumped down and the others looked on with interest. We're in Concord, I said. The Chinese have occupied it, but we didn't have a choice about going around. Anyway, there's a bunch of Humvees at a bar around the corner, and it looks like they're letting their hair down inside. We're going to go on foot and check it out. All right, who's going? Me, you, and Indigo. Indigo? Yes, Indigo, unless you want to take it up with her. Luke took one look at Indigo's determined face and shook his head. Nope, all good here. Okay, so we'll see if we can scavenge anything they might have out there and maybe learn something about their number and positioning in the city. But our main goal is going to be to disable the Humvees so they can't chase after us when we leave town. Ben jumped out and I could tell by the look on his face he was disappointed he wouldn't be going. Ben, I need you to stay here and guard the truck. If we're not back in thirty minutes, you and Sonny will be continuing without us. Okay, just make sure you're back, he said simply. We said our goodbyes and were turning to go when Brooke called out for us to wait. She jumped down and hugged each of us in turn. Luke was last and their hug seemed to linger. He avoided eye contact as we walked to the corner, but his red face and the knowing look Indigo had shared with Brooke said it all. I guess I didn't have to worry about him trying to impress Indigo after all. We stayed in the shadows as much as possible as we made our way around the block to the bar. I gave Luke a whispered account of our trip since the encounter with the bear, only leaving out the part where Indigo had kissed me. The fresh snow was already nearly four inches deep here, and it was resting on a half inch of older, compacted snow beneath it, and our boots made squelching noises as we walked. Reaching the corner of the main road, we could hear the beat of music and laughter even though the bar was still another block away. There didn't appear to be anyone guarding the vehicles in the parking lot. Why would there be? What exactly did they have to guard against? Hopefully, we could take advantage of their complacency. We should cross the street and sneak up along the front of those buildings, Luke said. We don't want to be exposed in the street when we get close to that place. Good idea. I looked both ways to make sure we weren't being observed before ushering Luke and Indigo across the street. 
We moved carefully in the snow and gathered under the awning of a drugstore on the other side. I'm glad you remembered to look both ways, Indigo said. I wasn't looking for traffic, I started, then realized by her cheeky smile that she was ribbing me. Well, Mom always told me, you never can be too careful. Their faces told me immediately that my attempt to continue the banter had fallen flat, and I made a mental note not to mention moms to people who have recently lost theirs. The window of the drugstore was intact, and I could see the shelves were still fairly well stocked. If we'd had more time, we probably could have raided it for supplies. We crept as stealthily as we could towards the bar, in a vain attempt to prevent our boots from making too much noise. The snow was still falling just as hard as before, but now a cold wind had begun to pick up, blowing straight down Main Street. We were close enough to make out the music now. It was country and western. Luke raised a hand, bringing us to a stop. Are they really listening to country music? Are we sure these are Chinese soldiers? Who else would they be? I asked. As silly as it was, even that one little question planted a seed of hope in my mind. Could it be Americans who had switched the power on? Had the flu been stopped before it wiped out the whole country? Well, there's only one way to find out, Indigo said. Let's get closer. We're still half a block away. Luke started forward again and we followed single file, our backs against the front of the buildings that lined this side of the street. We stopped at the corner opposite the bar and watched it from the shadows. The Grand Slam Bar and Grill looked as lively as it had probably been before the flu. Now that we were closer, we could see there were two more Humvees parked back where we couldn't see them from further down the highway. Humvees which clearly displayed the Chinese flag. I swallowed my disappointment, even though deep down I had known it would be the case. Six Humvees. If they were manned like the one at the gas station, we were looking at upwards of thirty-six soldiers in the bar. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea, Luke said quietly. He had obviously crunched the numbers, too. They're all inside and the windows of the bar are frosted and painted with baseball logos, I said, knowing we would never get as good a chance again to do some damage to the Chinese. I don't know, said Luke, unconvinced. It'll be fine. We'll be okay as long as they don't all come out at once, and from what we can hear, I don't think that'll happen. We have to try and at least cripple the Hummers, Luke. Look, they have machine guns in the ring mounts, just like the one from the gas station. Those things would tear the back of our truck to shreds if they came up behind us on the freeway. Sure, said Indigo. Let's do it. Luke still didn't look keen on the idea, but before he could say anything, we were interrupted by some atrociously off-key singing. The troops had clearly broken out the karaoke machine. We looked at each other and burst into giggling. Okay, I'm in said Luke, knuckle-bumping us each in turn. I can't let that horrible singing go unpunished. Great. That'll keep them busy and cover any noise we make. Come on, I said and started across the street, moving as fast as I dared in the snow. Indigo and Luke followed closely behind. When we reached the parking lot of the bar, we crouched down by the front fender of the Hummer furthest away from the door. Indigo kept watch on the building while I scanned the streets and Luke reached up to try the driver's side door. It wasn't locked. He opened it slowly and looked around inside. We could hop in and just drive it away, he whispered. It doesn't even need keys. It has a push-button ignition. Is there anything we can use in there? Not really. Only an extra box of ammo from the machine gun in the back seat. If you wanted to, we could climb in and rip up the other Humvees with the machine gun. That would cripple them for sure. That would make a racket that even drunk singing soldiers couldn't ignore. Crap! Indigo snapped. Get down! We dropped and Luke quietly closed the Hummer's door as the Chinese soldier Indigo had seen come through the door of the bar came stumbling down the front steps. My heart played a staccato rhythm in my chest as we watched the soldier through the grimy glass of the Hummer's windows. He was obviously drunk and wore a trench coat, which marked him as a conscript. Thankfully, he didn't seem to be paying attention to anything except trying to get his pants unzipped. 
He didn't even glance our way as he reeled a few steps along the wall on unsteady legs. Just as I thought he was about to fall, he came to a stop and propped himself against the wall and relieved himself. After what seemed like the world's longest whiz, he re-zipped his pants and then turned to stumble back to the bar. That was when Indigo dropped the revolver onto the snow-powdered pavement. She snatched it up immediately, looking horrified, but the damage had been done. Unfortunately, her fumble had come right in the break between songs, and the soldier stopped instantly at the sound. We ducked down and my bruised ribs protested as I flattened to the snow-covered asphalt. I could see his booted feet from that position, and for the longest time, he stood in one spot as I silently encouraged him to go back into the bar. Of course, he didn't. The boots turned our way and began a stumbling walk along the line of vehicles toward the one we were hiding behind. I scrambled to my knees and frantically waved the others to the rear of the Humvee. Hiding behind the Hummer, Luke raised his crossbow to me with a question in his eyes. I shook my head. We couldn't risk the soldier screaming if Luke's shot didn't kill him outright. It was then I realized that our footsteps and scuffs from hiding in the snow would be plainly visible when the soldier rounded the front of the truck. I made a quick decision and looked around frantically. There was a garden a few feet away that bordered the rear of the parking lot and my eyes fell upon a smooth, fist-sized rock. I stooped and ran to it and picked it up before running back to the others. I hefted it in my hand and indicated I was going to run around the truck and come up behind the soldier. Be careful, Indigo mouthed her eyes big and scared. I nodded and darted to the left rear corner of the Hummer just in time to see the soldier pass in front of the vehicle. I ran forward and stopped at the front fender before peeking carefully over the top. The soldier stood on the spot, swaying and looking down at the scuffed snow and prints where we had ducked to the ground. Almost in slow motion, I saw his gaze follow our footprints to the rear of the truck. He reached for his sidearm and suddenly didn't seem quite so drunk as he took a step towards the rear, where Luke and Indigo were hiding. I made my move. Fifteen. To be honest, I am probably lucky he was drunk. He didn't even twitch as I brought the rock down hard on the back of his neck. Just fell, as though boneless, to the snow-crusted ground. I stood over him, my chest heaving, but he didn't move. Come help me, I whispered. Nice work, Isaac, said Luke as he came around to me. We each grabbed an arm and dragged the soldier to the rock garden and dumped him there. Check the back of the Hummer, too. Maybe there will be something useful in there, I said to Luke, before scanning the street to make sure nobody was coming. Indigo watched the bar door again. We all knew his buddies might come looking for the missing soldier at any moment. Luke rummaged in the back of the Hummer, and a few moments later came back to us, carrying a long, sturdy wooden crate with Chinese characters on the side. With a grunt, he gently set down his heavy load and rushed back to the rear before closing the hatch and returning. This time, he was holding a length of what looked like rubber hose with some sort of pump attached to one end. Pay dirt in a trunk, boss, he whispered. What's that? I asked. Fuel siphon, he said, holding up the hose. We can drain the tanks of these babies dry. They won't be following us any place. How do you know it's for siphoning fuel? It was in a box that said fuel siphon, he said, grinning. Wise ass. How long will that take? I don't have a clue, man, he said. I guess in the neighborhood of five minutes a truck, give or take a few, depending on how much diesel is in the tanks. There are three of us, and I'd guess each Humvee has one of these in the back, so we could probably get all six done in about ten or fifteen minutes if we all pitched in. What's in the box? Indigo asked. Well, I don't read Chinese, but if that's what I think it is, it's going to come in real handy. Like an excited kid on Christmas morning, he pulled a long hunting knife out of the pocket of his ski pants and began to jimmy the top off. Another time and place, I may have asked where he had gotten the knife, 
but I was on edge, worried that at any moment another soldier might come out looking for their missing comrade. The lid came off with a soft splintering sound, and he brushed away the styrofoam beads to reveal a compact rocket launcher and three shiny rockets. Yes, Luke said triumphantly. It's a reusable launcher. He pulled the weapon out of the crate and hefted it before resting it against his shoulder as he flipped the sight open. Pass me a grenade, please, Indigo. Grenade? Yeah, they're not really rockets. They're self-propelled grenades. She handed him the grenade, which just looked like a rocket without the fins to me. Once again, I was amazed at his knowledge of weapons he really should have no clue about. Within a few seconds, he had the launcher loaded and hanging over his shoulder. He handed me and Indigo a spare grenade each. As I looked down on the deadly package in my hand, an idea began to formulate in my head. Screw the siphoning. We don't have time, I said. Besides, I think it's about time to get one back for our country. They both looked at me. Isaac, said Indigo, reading my mind. You can't. It would be murder. As much as I craved her approval, on this one I wasn't going to be swayed. I shook my head. You've seen what they've done to our country, Indigo. To our parents. What about all the kids who have starved? The babies. The babies who died starving in their cots as their parents rotted in the same house. That was murder. I saw a tear run down her cheek, and even though I was confident I was right, I felt like a low bastard for making her cry. She nodded and wiped her tears away with the back of her hands. Fine. You're the leader. It was clear it wasn't fine, though. I resisted the urge to try and justify my stance further. Come on, I said softly. Let's cross to the other side of the road. Luke picked up his crossbow and repocketed the knife before we headed across the main road at a jog. We crouched behind a snow-covered Chevy sedan directly opposite the front of the bar. Luke placed his crossbow on the pavement and reached into his parka pocket again, this time pulling out two small yellow objects, stuffing them in his ears one at a time. Earplugs? I seriously had to find out what else he had in those pockets of his. There was still no movement from the bar, just the muted sounds of country music and off-key singing. Can you get one through the glass of the front window? And will one do it? I said as loudly as I dared. He smiled grimly and nodded. These things are designed to stop tanks, he said, propping the rocket launcher against his right shoulder. One will do it. Put your fingers in your ears. These things are loud. He flipped the sight open. Ready? He asked. I nodded. I took a deep breath and held it. Without warning, the door of the bar opened and spilled light out onto the snow-covered parking lot as the silhouette of another Chinese soldier emerged. Shit. Thankfully, the door closed behind him, and as my eyes adjusted, I saw him looking around and calling out, clearly looking for the soldier we had taken down. Still a go? Luke asked me in a calm voice. In answer, I pulled my revolver out and gave a sharp nod. After three. One. Two. Three. There was a loud clap and whoosh that echoed off the empty buildings. I felt a quick burst of heat behind me, but all my attention was taken by the brief and bright journey of the grenade. Luke's aim was true, whether through luck or skill I'm not sure, but it hit the window dead center and the windows and doors blew out in a spectacular blast. We ducked as glass fell around us like sharp rain. When it was safe, I looked back over the hood of the Chevy and saw the soldier who had emerged just before the blast staggering to safety behind a Hummer, a pistol in his hand. No one else emerged from the smoking building. I stood up and walked around the rear of the Chevy and began to cross the road. Luke called to me, but I knew this had to be done. We couldn't have anyone radioing for help. Even in the unlikely scenario, the blast hadn't been heard or seen by any nearby patrols or soldiers. I was protected from his line of sight by the vehicles in the lot, and knew at this point he would be in a state of shock. I didn't think he would be looking to fight. I walked calmly to the first Humvee and crouched, resting my back against it. 
I heard a door open a few cars along. He's in the Hummer too, across from you, Luke yelled, his voice loud even over the crackling and popping of the burning building. I moved quickly and ran out from my position with my gun in front of me, squeezing shots as soon as I had him in sight. He was in the Hummer and had just raised the mic to his mouth. My first shot missed, but the second hit his shoulder, and the next got him in the chest as he slumped forward. The horn started blaring. I stood where I was for a minute. My gun trained on him, but he didn't move again. With my weapon still aimed at him, I walked slowly around to his door and pulled it open. He was dead. I pocketed my gun and used two hands to pull him away from the wheel. The horn cut out into a silence interrupted only by the crackling of the fire. There was a semi-automatic rifle on the floor of the cab under his feet. I grabbed it. I had a feeling we would need all the firepower we could get in the next few hours. I ran back to Indigo and Luke, who were ready to roll, and we headed back to the truck as fast as we could in the icy conditions. The others had obviously heard the explosion. They surrounded us when we got back, their looks of concern turning to relief. All except Sonny. What the hell happened? Sonny asked. A little taken aback by his sharp tone, I brushed past. We need to move, I said. I'll explain when we're on the road. Everybody, back in the truck. Indigo asked Luke if they could swap places so she could go in back. She was withdrawn, and I knew she was upset with me. It was strange to think that just twenty minutes ago she had kissed me on the lips, and now we weren't even talking. I have to admit I was kind of relieved when she got in the back, both because I would have Luke up front, but mainly so I could avoid discussing what had happened with her. In just a couple of minutes, we were moving again. From the corner of my eye, I saw Sonny glaring at me. Well... We just took out a whole platoon with a rocket launcher, Luke blurted, clearly excited at the evening's events. Sounded like it, too, he said bitterly. Haven't you guys ever heard of stealth? We're going to have the whole damn Chinese army hot on our asses now. I was silent for a moment. It was crucial not to get into a fight at this point. We needed to be a cohesive unit. In calm tones, I explained what had happened and also my reasoning to Sonny. Whether he agreed, or whether he just decided to let it go because he didn't want to fight, he left it at that. But I could tell he wasn't a happy camper. We continued along the back roads a few blocks before turning onto the main street again. It would turn into the highway once we left Concord. Sonny drove as fast as he deemed safe in the conditions. We didn't see any other sign of occupation, and I began to think the group of soldiers at the bar may have been the only presence in the small city. A few minutes later, the searchlight of a helicopter piercing the night about two miles to our right disabused me of that idea. It was clearly headed to the scene of our recent show of defiance. Luke and I craned our necks to watch its progress, but it didn't turn in our direction. We breathed a collective sigh of relief. I wish this thing could go faster, Luke said. It could, said Sonny, but we don't want to draw attention to ourselves if we do happen to pass any Chinese vehicles. There was a slight lull in the snowfall as we reached the intersection where the highway joined another major road to turn and follow the river. Sonny took a left, following the sign that pointed the way to Interstate 93. An incident-free half hour later, we were on the freeway headed north. The ease of our passage led to happy optimism, with Luke cracking jokes and telling us what he would eat when we arrived at the safe haven. I hoped fervently that it really did exist. We didn't exactly have a plan B. We didn't see the vehicle that had come up behind us until I saw the headlights in the passenger side mirror, barely a hundred yards back. Crap, I said. We have company. 16. We were only five minutes beyond the outskirts of the city. I felt the buoyant mood in the cab dissipate like smoke. Sonny swore under his breath. What do we do? I asked, scowling into the mirror as I pulled my gun out again. We just keep driving, nice and steady, Sonny said, placing his hand on my gun. You two get down in the footwell. Luke and I awkwardly climbed down onto the floor. 
I somehow ended up on top of him, my elbow accidentally poking him in the butt as I tried to keep my gun hand free. I didn't know you cared. He cracked, and in my adrenaline-wired state, he almost brought a giggle from me. The laugh was choked from me when the car following us moved into the center lane and came up alongside the truck. I watched Sonny from my vantage on the floor. He stayed focused on the road ahead, but when it was clear the occupants of the vehicle had slowed to the pace of the truck, he looked down at them and waved. They didn't pass us, though, and just as I was thinking the game was up, he put a hand to his ear and made a strange face, as though trying to understand something. I heard him make an ah sound, and he reached and flicked the lights on, waving gratefully to the SUV. They tooted their horn and after a few worrying seconds, sped up and passed us before shooting off. They're gone, Sonny said. Luke and I struggled back into our seats. My bad with the headlights. Maybe they would have just passed if I hadn't made the call earlier to switch them off while we were driving, I said. I can't believe they didn't try and pull us over. This truck is pretty damaged, Luke said. I don't know, Sonny said. We got lucky, I guess. Maybe seeing me in the driver's seat allayed any suspicions they might have had about the damage? If I had to guess, I would say that was a government vehicle, not military, and they were probably in a hurry. We still need to be wary of heat from your little escapade back in Concord, though. Yep, we dodged another bullet, said Luke. You played it real cool, Sonny. Well done. I'm worried about the road ahead, though. What if they have some sort of checkpoint or base up I-95? If there is, we're screwed, I said. I think maybe we should take the truck all the way into Lincoln. It's the only disguise we have. If a military vehicle passes us while we're walking along the freeway on foot, you know for sure they'll take us. At least in the truck we have some chance. I'm still worried it'll make us easier to track if the Chinese find the truck further along our route. But it'll certainly be a safer and warmer trip, said Sonny. Why don't we take it all the way to Drake Mountain? Luke asked. Too risky. If there are refugees there or nearby, we might lead the Chinese right to them, Sonny said. Yeah, we'll have to walk at least a few miles in the snow either way. Worse than that, Sonny said, the road from Lincoln to Drake Mountain Resort is all uphill. This is not going to be fun, said Luke. I could almost hear the groan in his voice. The snow resumed what could reasonably be called dumping down again, and we rode in silence for about fifteen minutes, each lost in our own thoughts. I dared to hope we might make it to our destination without any other encounters with the Chinese. It was not to be, however. We had just passed a sign proclaiming it was five miles until we reached the exit to Lincoln when we saw four sets of headlights speeding from the opposite direction toward Concord. Uh-oh, said Luke. Those are most definitely Hummers, and they're in a real hurry. The word is out. We watched as a line of vehicles sped past. For a second, I thought we were safe, and then I saw one slow and turn onto the snow-covered grass strip that separated us from them. Luke and I craned our necks to watch it. He's definitely coming for us, said Luke unnecessarily. Sonny didn't need any more encouragement and immediately planted his foot. We put some distance between us and them as the Hummer slipped and slid across the grass before finally skidding back onto the tarmac. The truck's engine whined in protest at Sonny's heavy foot and maxed out at 65 mph. The headlights of the Hummer closed the gap quicker than seemed fair, and I found myself leaning forward as if trying to help propel the truck. The wind whistled through the broken windows. My ears were numb and I wished I was wearing a beanie and earmuffs. Miraculously, once it caught up with us, the pursuing vehicle slowed, so it maintained about a 200-foot gap between us. "'Why aren't they pulling us over?' I shouted. "'I think they called for assistance,' Sonny yelled over the howling wind. "'There's another set of headlights coming up behind the first. That explained it. They were waiting for the second Hummer before they ran us off the road. If their commanders had put two and two together— they would know we were the same truck which had busted up their roadblock and that we had struck again at the bar. 
I reloaded the empty chambers of my gun, and Luke held his crossbow cocked in his hand. The rocket launcher was at his feet, along with the remaining two grenades. I felt a sinking feeling as the headlights of the second Hummer caught up with the first. The first one moved into the left lane and sped up as both vehicles began to close in on us. There's the ramp, Sonny called. I turned back to the highway and was surprised to see we were closing on the off-ramp pretty quickly. Just another two minutes and we would make it. Sonny stomped the accelerator to the floor of the truck and managed to eke out another few miles an hour. It wasn't enough. The Hummer in the left lane drew up beside us and matched our speed. Sonny twisted the wheel sharply, crashing into its front fender. Metal screeched for a few scary seconds, and then the Chinese vehicle braked and slowed as Sonny veered back into his own lane, swerving this way and that to prevent the Hummer coming up on us again. His evasive driving bought us the time we needed, and he waited until the last second before he took the turn onto the off-ramp, without slowing. Luke and I gripped the dashboard, but we were still thrown in the air hard enough to bump our heads on the ceiling of the cab. I heard muffled squealing from our people in the back. Sonny sped towards a set of blacked-out traffic lights and slowed only slightly as he took a wide turn into the two-lane road that bisected Lincoln and the freeway. The truck leaned sickeningly but righted itself with a heavy bump. Luke took a quick look back through his broken window. They're still hot on our tails. The good news, though, is their Hummers don't have machine guns on the top, he reported. I was thankful that he hadn't thought of trying to take a pot shot at them with the rocket launcher. We couldn't afford to waste a shot. I was pretty sure we were going to need everything we had very soon. I was thinking furiously. We had to lose these guys or we were screwed. We couldn't continue to outrun them, and pretty soon they'd probably call in air support. I made a quick decision. Sonny, take a right into the next alley you see. Are you sure that's a good idea? We'll be trapped if it's not open at the other end. We have to try something. We can't risk them calling in air support. All right, what do you have in mind? Luke, make sure your rocket launcher is ready to fire. If we can disable the one in front, it'll block the second from following us. Here, take this one, Sonny. I gestured wildly to the narrow alley coming up fast on our right. The tire screeched as he swung us into it and I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw that it was open at the other end. The truck narrowly squeezed past a large dumpster. Pull up here, I yelled. Luke and I jumped out just as the first timer pulled into the alley and he began to bring the rocket launcher up into firing position. Wait, help me move the dumpster first. We heaved it into the middle of the alley as the second Hummer turned in behind the first. The lead vehicle screeched to a halt about fifty feet away and Chinese soldiers began to pile out as we ducked back behind the dumpster. I took a breath, about to scream fire. I didn't need to. The launcher was already nestled against Luke's shoulder. When the soldiers saw Luke, they stopped in their tracks and turned. One of them managed to squeeze off a burst from their weapons as they retreated. I ducked as bullets whizzed by and thunked into the dumpster. Luke didn't flinch at the hail of bullets and calmly pulled the trigger. The rocket launcher jerked in his arm and the grenade zeroed in on the front grill of the Hummer. There followed an almighty whoomp and a burst of heat as the front of the Hummer exploded, the whole vehicle jumping into the air a few feet before crashing back to the pavement. Without exception, all the soldiers who had jumped from the vehicle were cut down by the blast. The twisted, smoking wreckage of the vehicle now blocked the alley. I heard shots being fired from behind the smoking wreck. Quick, back to the truck, I yelled to Luke. He looked a little dazed, so I grabbed his arm, dragging him along as we ran for the truck. As we passed, I could hear voices calling from inside the cargo bay. Stay down flat on the floor until I give you the all clear, I yelled. Luke and I piled back into the truck cabin, and Sonny had it moving before I had even pulled the door shut. He took a sharp left at the end of the alley, causing the truck to lurch treacherously again. Once more, I heard muffled screams in the back and was thankful I wasn't in the cargo bay. Indigo would surely be regretting her decision to ride in back. If we managed to get out of this, they would again be a bruised and sorry group of people. Luke gasped audibly as the truck righted itself. Are you okay? I asked. Luke was a pale guy at the best of times, but his face was the color of ash now. He smiled ruefully at me and pulled his heavy parka open. Honey, I forgot to duck, he said. My heart sunk when I saw the bullet wound. The round had taken him in the abdomen, and blood was seeping steadily from the wound. Sonny took another left and Luke flinched. We were headed back to the main road. 
I don't think it went through, man. He lifted his parka at the back and turned so I could see. He was right. It hadn't. I felt tears sting my eyes. My best friend was shot and we had no way to care for him. Even gut shot. His crooked smile was still in place. Don't worry, Chief. It's going to take more than a little lead to bring me down. Get something on that to staunch the bleeding, Sonny ordered. The first aid kit is in the glove box. We turned right onto the main road and Sonny again floored the accelerator. There was no sign of the second Hummer, but I knew it was only a matter of time before they were tailing us again. I pulled out the kit and sopped up the blood as best I could. His wound didn't seem to be bleeding too badly, thankfully, but I knew an abdomen shot was supposed to be one of the worst. I put two gauze pads against the wound and covered it with an adhesive bandage. Luke didn't crack a joke, which told me how bad it really was. We're almost out of Lincoln, said Sonny. We need to dump the truck. It'll be harder for them to trace us on foot. I argued for driving on, debating it would be too hard on the wounded. But in the end, a pair of headlights in the distance behind us won the argument for him. Again, luck was on our side. One of the last buildings on our side of the street was a three-story office building, and we turned down the side street and then down into its underground parking garage. Sonny pulled up short of the boom gate. Jump out and put it up, Isaac. I don't want to smash through it, as it will leave them a clue if they happen to look down here. I jumped out and pulled up the boom gate, allowing the truck to drive past before easing it back down, then followed the ramp down into the darkened garage. I joined Sonny and Luke at the back of the truck as they pulled the door up. We were greeted by a rush of questions and did our best to answer as we ushered our shaken passengers out. Thankfully, Indigo took my hand when I offered it, but we separated without saying anything once she was on her feet. Luke was surprisingly mobile, considering his wound. He had been shot and was still trooping on. It made me ashamed of the groaning I had done over my bruised ribs. I left the rocket launcher in the truck. Luke said, Sorry, I won't be able to carry it. What's wrong? asked Brooke, weaving her way to Luke. I got shot, he said, the same way he might have said he'd stubbed his toe. He pulled his parka open. Brooke clapped her hand over her mouth and immediately began fussing over him as the others joined. Don't worry, I, I don't think it hit anything vital, I heard him say as I went to the front of the truck to grab the rocket launcher. Indigo came up to me and we looked at each other awkwardly as I put its carry strap over my shoulder. Are you okay, Isaac? Yeah, I'm good. How about you? Yeah, shaken but not stirred, she said with a small smile before we headed back to the others. My people gathered what we could carry from the truck and then headed to the rear of the small parking garage. My people... I think I had finally come to terms with the fact that I had a new place to belong. Well, not a place exactly, but a family of sorts. It's funny how adversity can bring strangers closer than blood. We talked quickly about heading as fast as we could to the tree line, and then made our way up a set of steps into the lane behind the building and began walking. We froze in place just before we emerged from behind the building when we heard the engine of what could only be the second Hummer speeding down the main street. It passed our position speeding along the highway, its occupants assuming correctly that we were headed in that direction, but not realizing we had ditched our transportation. They'll be back before long, said Sonny. Once they work out, they should have caught us up. We continued to follow the road, sticking to the tree line even though the traveling was much harder. We had been trudging for about ten minutes when we heard the rumble of a motor, coming back down the mountain. Quick, everyone down, I yelled. We all managed to get down to our knees in the scrub and behind trees before the same Humvee that had passed us came back towards Lincoln. It was traveling much slower this time, the occupants obviously scanning the area as they retraced their path. It seemed to take forever for them to pass, and I didn't realize I had been holding my breath until my lungs began to burn. I counted out two minutes before I waved everyone to their feet and we set off again. There were a few farmhouses along this part of the highway, but they were few and far between and dwindled away as the road got steeper and gave way to light forest. Even with our wounded people and loaded up with what we were carrying, the walk up the mountain was not as bad as I thought it would be. But despite the relative ease, 
I could see Luke's strength beginning to fade, even as he leant against Brooke. I moved in beside him and ordered him to put his free arm around my shoulder. He looked like he was going to protest, but did as I asked. We walked on and I prayed desperately that the safe haven we had traveled so far for actually existed. There was no backup plan. It had to be there. 17. It had begun snowing lightly when we arrived in Lincoln, and now, as we trudged through the trees, our shoes crunching through about six inches of snow, it began to fall harder. That was when I heard the unmistakable sound of a helicopter coming from the direction of the small city we had left behind. I shook my head in resignation as we all stopped and looked back down the mountain and over Lincoln. Brooke pointed out the searchlight, which was sweeping from left to right as it followed the highway through the small city. Luke reached over, wincing at the movement, and tapped the rocket launcher. You might need this soon, he whispered. I nodded, and we set off again, a little more purpose in our steps. I tried not to look back as the noise of the chopper got closer and closer, but eventually the sound changed slightly, and I realized it was now taking a more direct route, straight up the mountain. We were all puffing hard, both through exertion and fear, when we finally reached a sign that read, Drake Mountain Ski Resort. We left the tree line of the highway and hurried across a long concrete bridge. The chopper sounded even closer now, and when I looked back, I could also see the splash of headlights illuminating the trees from road level. The second hummer. God damn it. We were so close. We rushed across the bridge and around a bend, and there it was. Our supposed safe haven. The ski lodge sat a couple hundred yards away, in a natural depression. Its windows were dark. A lot of them broken. The lodge was clearly abandoned. Brooke began to cry softly, and Luke cursed under his breath. Feeling as hopeless as anyone, I urged them on with Sonny bringing up the rear and shouting words of reassurance. Even if the safe haven didn't exist, we still needed any protection the abandoned lodge would afford us. We had just made it through the open gates in the stone fence of the lodge when the chopper's engine made a high-pitched whine as it picked up speed. They had spotted us. Keep going! I screamed at the others, pushing them ahead as it roared toward us. Luke and I turned to face the enemy. Sonny paused, too, but I told him to get the others to shelter. Be careful, Isaac, Indigo called as she passed me. I looked at her, wondering if it was for the last time. Help me get this thing loaded, Luke. We squatted on the ground and I handed Luke the grenade. Even though clearly suffering, he deftly loaded the weapon and pulled out the sight before falling onto his backside, panting. He pointed at the trigger. Don't pull it too soon and aim a little above the chopper. The trajectory will drop after the initial. I didn't hear the rest of his words. I turned as the chopper closed in. The bright circle of light from the spotlight trailed over the uneven ground, heading right toward us. I placed the rocket launcher against my shoulder. I looked quickly down at Luke in time to see him collapse face down on the ground, a bloom of blood soaking the snow around him. At the sight of my friend... A sob wrenched my throat, and my eyes blurred with tears. I raised the weapon and took aim at the chopper as the distant screech of tires indicated the Hummer had also arrived. I didn't allow my concentration to waver, even as the Hummer's headlights illuminated the entire area. 18. I squeezed the trigger and was promptly knocked to my ass by the concussion of the blast. The weapon fell from my hands and sizzled in the snow beside me as I watched the trajectory of the grenade with my ears ringing. It flew at the chopper and missed it completely. Frustration and anger burned through me as its fiery trail etched a line across the night sky before it arced back to earth and exploded harmlessly in the forest. The chopper pilot had veered needlessly away from the wayward shot, and I was climbing to my feet as he steadied the aircraft. Its spotlight found me. I'd had enough. I was done. I pulled the revolver from my pocket 
and stalked toward the chopper, firing shot after shot until the firing mechanism clicked on empty chambers. Even then, I continued pulling the trigger. Come on! I screamed up at it and waited for hot lead to tear me apart. That's when the world exploded. Again, I found myself on my backside, staring dumbfounded as the helicopter, now in flames, began plummeting to the ground with all the grace of a brick dropped from a ladder. I registered the white-clad figures running in from all directions, even the fact that one of them was carrying a smoking rocket launcher, but I didn't pause to look more closely. I scrambled to my feet and ran back to Luke, falling over him just as the chopper hit the ground a hundred yards from us, throwing up debris and snow. When I felt it was safe... I started to climb off my friend and found myself staring into the muzzle of a machine gun. I looked up, half expecting to see a Chinese face standing over me. It wasn't. It was a middle-aged, American man. The first non-Chinese person over the age of 16. In more than a month. Do not move! He screamed down at me as I looked up at him with wide eyes. Behind him, the enemy hummer screeched to a stop and soldiers began to pile out. The men standing over me didn't even flinch and it became obvious why soon enough. The Chinese soldiers weren't aware of the danger they were in and were cut down mercilessly in a one-sided firefight that lasted all of five seconds. The men in white camouflage immediately secured the area. Throw down your weapons and place your hands on your head! yelled a gruff voice from the direction of the lodge. I looked over. My people were placing their guns on the ground and putting their hands in the air as the men in white closed in on them. Do it! Now! I could see Sonny still held his semi-automatic and I held my breath, not exhaling until he finally bent over and placed it carefully on the snow-crusted grass in front of him. I snuck a closer look at the man standing over me. He was armed with what looked to me like a U.S. military-issue M-16 and also had the telltale haircut of a military man. These guys were U.S. Army. But how could they be? I tried to stop him when he bent over and reached for Luke's throat. He brushed me away. Easy, son. He felt for Luke's pulse and immediately called out. We have a casualty over here. I need a medic and a stretcher. Two men materialized with a fold-up stretcher, and I watched them carefully lift my friend onto it as the man led me over to the rest of my group. As we joined them, still with their hands in the air, the two men carrying Luke jogged past us and through the open door of the lodge. Where are they taking him? Sonny asked. He's in good hands. If he can be saved, the doc will save him, said the gray-haired man who had ordered the others to put down their weapons. His features looked like they were cut from granite, and there was an air of authority about him. We came because we heard the Morse code message on the radio, I called as I was pushed into the huddle. We're looking for sanctuary, not trouble. Looking at the men, I reassessed my initial impression. Not all of these men were soldiers. Not by any stretch. You can't take them in, Randall. They're spies. A man with a long, bushy beard and his gut straining against the material of his white uniform pushed forward. Hell, they led the fuckers right to us. They even brought one of the chinks with them. We should waste them now. Watch your fucking mouth, Leroy, or I'll waste you. Randall snapped. The fat hillbilly was only able to hold the fierce stare of the older man for a few seconds before looking down at his feet. We're going to take them to the professor, Randall addressed all his men, just like we do for anyone who answers the signal. I took a closer look at Randall, impressed by his handling of the loudmouth. He looked fit and hard, although he was by far the oldest man in the group, clearly military or ex-military, and obviously the leader. He looked us over with steel-blue eyes. Each of you stay right where you are. A couple of my men are going to come and search you. If you make any move at all I consider threatening, you'll be shot, no questions asked. Do you understand? We all nodded. I understood the words, of course, but was struggling to understand why this was happening. Had the message been a trap all along? Or were they just being overly cautious? As the men stepped forward to search us, I realized they were a real mix. Some white, some black, at least one of them looked Hispanic. There were no Chinese men among them, not even a vaguely Asian-looking person. There were also no women, for that matter. 
My brain worked furiously, trying to figure this out. Had these people avoided exposure to the Pyongyang flu? Or were they somehow immune? Could there be some sort of vaccine against it? I had hoped we might find safety and answers here at Drake Mountain, but so far we had only found danger and more questions. The men quickly patted us down and checked our bags, confiscating blades and anything else that might be used against them, before collecting our firearms from the floor. Sonny soon had a scattering of knives and shuriken on the floor by his feet. Indigo's revolver was taken away as well. While we were being searched, I noticed another group of men cleaning up the mess left by the firefight. I had to admit, they were quick and efficient. Clearly, they wanted no trace of the firefight remaining if the Chinese came looking for the missing soldiers and helicopter. The search was conducted without any hiccups, and we were directed through the front entrance of the lodge. Overhead lights were switched on, and we shaded our eyes as their leader, Randall, came forward. Zip tie their hands and black bag them, and we'll head out. Surely there's no need for that, Sonny said, taking a half step toward Randall. We're on your side. There was a click-fizz sound, and suddenly Sonny jerked up straight, his arms locked at his sides before falling to the ground and convulsing spasmodically. Brooke screamed, and the humming sound faded, leaving Sonny a twitching heap on the floor. It was Leroy. He had a taser in his hand, the wires running up to small prongs in Sonny's back. Enraged, I took a step forward, only to feel the hand of one of my captors grip my shoulder firmly. The guns of the men around us kept everyone else at bay. I still say we waste them, or at least the chink, began Leroy. He didn't get a chance to finish his thought, because Randall stepped forward and grabbed him by the throat. We don't know he is an enemy, Leroy. Randall grated through gritted teeth. You have to look deeper than a person's skin. Do you understand? Leroy, his face now a distinct purple shade, dropped the taser and tried to pry the fingers of the old man away. Randall squeezed harder and shook him a little. Do you understand? Leroy nodded desperately and patted the back of Randall's hand. The old man released him and he fell to his knees, sucking in deep, sobbing gulps of air. Good. Now get him up and bound. If he doesn't reach the professor in one piece, I'm going to gut you. Randall's words heartened me a little. At least we were being taken to see someone. Maybe this professor guy would be more reasonable, but where was he? And why were they going to black bag us? The men that had searched us went around to us one by one, starting with me. My hands were pulled behind my back and secured with a plastic zip tie, tight enough to hold them, but not tight enough to cut off circulation. All around me, the rest of my group were being similarly treated. I caught Indigo's eyes and nodded reassuringly before a black sack was pulled down over her head. I did the same for as many of the others as I could before my own head was covered and the world went dark. Sightless and surrounded by armed men, of which one at least was dangerous, I was as scared as I ever remembered being in my life. Now, we're going to lead you through some tight places, I heard Randall say from in front of us, and it's going to be a bit of a hike. You'll be fine as long as you stay on the path and don't do anything stupid. A hand grabbed my shoulder and prompted me forward. Let's go, people. Leroy, cut the lights.